Good evening and welcome everybody to tonight's talk, the ISR program for research on black Americans and archive data at ICPSR. This presentation provides a brief history of survey research data collections among African Americans. It will discuss the role of ISR's program for research on black Americans in collecting the National Survey of Black Americans and the National Survey of American Life, or NSAL. The presentation also presents select findings from the NSAL, including research on the association between everyday discrimination and mental health. So we have two speakers tonight. The first is Robert Joseph Taylor. He's an MSW and a PhD, and is the Sheila Feld Collegiate Professor and the Harold Johnson Endowed Professor of Social Work at the University of Michigan. He's also the Director of the Program for Research on Black Americans at the Institute for Social Research. Professor Taylor has published three books and over 175 journal articles in two major areas, African-American family social support networks and African-American religious participation. He's been principal investigator of several grants from the National Institute on Aging, which examine the role of religion in the lives of black and white elderly adults. He's been co-principal investigator with James Jackson on several grants from the National Institute of Mental Health on the correlates of mental health and mental illness among Black Americans, including the only major national probability surveys of Black Americans, again, the National Survey of Black Americans and the National Survey of American Life. Also joining us is David Thomas, who is a senior data project manager at ICPSR. He's been with ICPSR since 2003 and has held various positions across the curation and project management teams. He's been with the Resource Center for Minority Data, or RCMD, since 2007 as the Archive and Project Manager. RCMD is an archive whose mission is to acquire, disseminate, and promote data on underrepresented populations. While its initial focus was on underrepresented populations by race and ethnicity, that focus has expanded to include underrepresented gender identity and sexual orientation. So Robert and David, welcome. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Scott. Give me a second here. Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, the title of my presentation, or what I'm discussing today, is survey research and African Americans. Uh, in particular, a little bit more, a little bit about the history of survey research with African Americans, with a little bit more information about the National Survey of American Life. So first, before we start, uh, this is uh, um, some contact information. This is our Twitter um, handle. Uh, this is uh, our website. And this is our, my uh, personal email address. In case you have any questions later, feel free to contact me. So here is a brief outline of what I'm going to cover today. So number one, a little bit about the selected history of survey research, uh, the National Survey of Black Americans. I'm going to spend some time about the accomplishments of the students from the National Survey of Black Americans, as well as students from the Program for Research on Black Americans. Um, from there, I'm going to talk about the National Survey of American Life and selecting findings from NSAL studies. And this includes a little bit of information on gender differences and a little bit of information on discrimination. So you can't really discuss survey research in the United States without first talking about W.E.B. Du Bois and the Philadelphia Negro. Uh, du Bois did his work in the Seventh Ward of Philadelphia. Book, the book titled Philadelphia Negro was published in 1899, <clears throat> again, 120 years ago. This is considered the first major empirical sociological study. Again, not study of, of black people, but the first major empirical sociological study in the United States. Uh, he didn't use the term mixed methods, but we would probably call it a mixed method study now. Um, 
that he and his research assistant did 5,000 in-person interviews. He and his wife lived in the seventh ward for 15 months. So part of their study was ethnographic. Part of it was archival. Uh, du Bois had a history, um, had part of his history was studying history, being a historian at his time at Harvard. And part of the book was spatial analysis. The book to read if you want to learn about Du Bois as a scholar is the book I've shown here, uh, The Scholar Denied by Alden Morris. This is, uh, uh, in terms of spatial analysis, this is from the book as distribution of African Americans in the seventh ward of Philadelphia. So I'm gonna skip up almost 50 years to the beginning of the Institute for Social Research. Starting in 46 uh, by uh, uh, Lickert was the first director and many of you may have heard of the Lickert Strail. Um, I'm, I've never, I've heard his name pronounced many different ways. I've heard Likert, I've heard Lickert. Um, so I'm not sure which one is correct. Uh, but the most important part is that many people know his name from the scale, but do not know that he was the first director of ISR. Older, older people in this audience may have seen this picture. And this is Harry Truman with a headline that says, Dewey defeats Truman. However, we know that there, we never had a president Dewey. This headline was incorrect because all the polls at that point were incorrect and they all predicted a Dewey landslide. There was a Gallup poll during that time, which is still around, the Roper poll, and they almost faced ruin because of this. However, ISR had a study in the field. It was on foreign affairs, it had two questions. It was the only study to accurately predict that Truman was gonna win. And it was the only study based on a national probability sample. And that's the difference. It was based on a probability sample. So I will skip up to 1957, because I want to talk about Gerald Gurren. He was the PI of the American Institute of Mental Health. And this is, uh, from what I've gathered, the first national uh, study of mental health. Again, this is out of the Institute for Social Research. So if you go between 1948 and 1978, there are literally hundreds of national probability samples, national probability studies on the general population, and none on minority groups. So the question is, well, why, why is, were there no national studies? So number one is probably interest. There, pre-civil rights movement, there are only a handful of African-American social scientists. Someone like Du Bois was very unusual, with very few black PhDs. Second part is the cost, uh, very expensive. Uh, uh, cost for a sample of African-Americans is expensive, not unmanageable, but still quite expensive. Between 1975, I'm skipping up a, a, a little bit now, between 75 and 77, Pat Guerin, who's pictured right here, and Jerry Guerin, who's pictured here, both thought it was time for national studies of minority groups. So Pat Guerin became the co-PI of the National Chicano Survey, and Jerry Guerin became the co-PI of the National Survey of Black America. All of these investigators are psychologists, which is why I talk about mental health a lot, and which is why the goal of this study was a mental health study. So James Jackson, who's pictured here, is the PI. Belinda Tucker is a co-PI. Uh, Philip Bowman is the other co-PI. And of course, Gerald Gurren, who I just mentioned. These are some of the graduate students. Uh, again, not an exhaustive list, but uh, some of the graduate students who worked and some of the other staff who worked on the National Survey of Black Americans. And again, because this was done, you know, um, almost 40 years ago, roughly 40 years ago, 
um, we can look at uh, where these individuals are now. And what we see here is this is as a group, a fairly accomplished group. So Ronald Brown is the former chair of political science at Wayne State. Cleopatra Caldwell is the current chair of, a, of the Health Behavior and Health Education Department and Public Health here in Michigan. Linda Chatter Chatters is the Paula uh, Mirez Collegiate Professor. Wayne McCullough is a former president of the American Association of Public Opinion Research. Again, I'm the Harold Johnson Chair. Letha, Ch Letha Chadiha, who's retired, um, was the Rose Gibson Collegiate Chair. And Rose Gibson, who obviously is also uh, retired, uh, was the only Black editor, so I used to say the first and only Black editor of a major gerontology journal. And then lastly, Harold Neighbors is the C.S. Mott Endowed Professor at Michigan State. Here are some uh, leadership positions of, of uh, program for research on Black Americans alumni. It's way too many to mention, but I thought it was important to acknowledge. We have several, um, several vice chancellors, several uh, provosts, associate provosts, several deans. And the Black font, uh, these are people at, at different universities across the country. The red colored font are for people who work in the, uh, in the government. So we see the Census Bureau and the CDC. Blue are people here in Michigan. And purple are at historically black colleges and universities, otherwise known as HBCUs. We're one of the few groups, I'm not, I don't want to say only group, because I don't know that for a fact, but one of the few groups that uh, holds reunions. This is a picture from our 40th reunion in 2016. And we've had one other re reunion and we we're hoping to have one this year, but obviously uh, we could not do that this year. So why conduct a national sample of African Americans? Why is it important? So I'm gonna give you some reasons. So number one, most national studies during this period had an N of 1500. And with that N, you get mostly maybe 100 African Americans. Well, what it means is too few African Americans to, to conduct subgroup analysis. You couldn't do analysis only on old African Americans, or only on African American women, or only on single mothers. So all African Americans were always lumped together, which means there was no heterogeneity. You just could not do that type of analysis. So what it means is in these studies, by default, you're doing racial differences. And what it means is all Blacks look alike. Number two, well, the issues that pertain to African Americans that are, 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 that are important that may not be as important to other groups. So racial identity is one, racial socialization. Um, you hear that as one top part of racial socialization that you hear in the media all the time is the talk about how young men in particular should act around the police. Uh, an expanded religion section. Uh, questions like fictive kin are questions that have only been on uh, African-American surveys. Well, then one would argue, why not simply do an oversample of the, Afri the African-American population? And the reason is actually quite simple, but many people don't know this. The geographic distribution of the total population and the African American population are different. So what it means is that if you do an oversample, the oversample of, of African Americans will be based on the distribution of the total population, not the distribution of the African American population. So if you look at this bar graph, I just want you to look at, pay attention to the South. And what you see right here is, this darker is the 2016 census. Uh, the, um, for the total population, this is the South is, um, I'm sorry, this middle bar 
is for the uh, blacks only for the 2016 census. And then the last is uh, NSAL African American. And what you see is a m m many more black people in the South um, in the, the black census and the NSAL. Conversely, if you look at the West, you see there's a lot more people in the total population in the West and a lot less in terms of African Americans. So again, if you want to do a, a study of African Americans and totally represent their geographical distribution, um, just doing an oversample is not a good way to do it. Just as important, we know the South and the West, where you really see the differences, are very different. Just politically, the South is way more conservative and the West is way more liberal. So, National Survey of Black Americans conducted in 79 and 80, face to face interviews. Um, sample size of 2,107. For the first time, differences uh, within group differences of the adult Black population. And again, we can't really summarize 300 studies and numerous dissertations. But we can say quite simply, this showed that all Black people are not. This showed heterogeneity among the Black population. Give me a so National Survey of Black Americans was proposed as a mental health study. And the title of it was, the title of the proposal that was funded by NIMH was Group Identity and Mental Health. However, when the, when the PIs and the graduate students were working on the NSBA questionnaire, it was clear that this would be the first National Survey of Black Americans, period. So it really became, instead of a mental health survey, the survey of Black American life. So issues such as family, religion, employment, neighborhood, racial identity, as well as mental health were all covered in the survey, as opposed to a, a straightforward or more, uh, uh, more focused coverage of group identity. In 91, Ronald Kessler starts National Comorbidity Study. Again, I'm sort of going back this, again, we're going through the history of survey research um, as it relates to African Americans. And in this study, Kessler measures the prevalence rates of psychiatric disorders among the U.S. population. So it's, uh, it's a bit more detailed than mental health. It's really, again, disorders. So mid 90s to late 90s, both Ronald Kessler and our, and our research team write proposals for new national sub surveys. Both are funded, but they were written separately. Um, they weren't written in collaboration with each other. Um, however, they were linked together by NIMH. And later there was a survey of Hispanics and Asians that also became part of this. Together, these three surveys make up the collaborative psychiatric ep epi studies. So again, Kessler's comorbidity, National Survey of American Life, and the National Survey of Hispanics and Asians. These are the principal investigators of the National Survey of American Life. So ja again, James Jackson is the PI. Then the co-PIs of Cleopatra Caldwell, Harold Neighbors, Randolph Nessie, myself, and David Williams. Um, these are the final ends for the NSAL. So 6,000 adult interviews, which includes African Americans, Black Caribbeans, and non-Hispanic whites, as well as almost 1,200 African American and Black Caribbean adolescent interviews. This is a distribution of, of, uh, of Black Caribbeans in the United States. Again, heavily Northeast, a little bit in Florida. You see Atlanta and 
Houston and Chicago, and a little bit in terms of New Orleans, in terms of Haitians in particular. So again, talking about diversity, we know there's a lot of diversity among African Americans. So that's a tremendous amount of diversity with Black Caribbean. In terms of uh, diet, in terms of customs, and even in terms of language. These are the countries that are most represented, and these are the, the larger countries in terms of immigration. There are over 25 countries of origin, uh, Jamaica being the largest, and then we have Haiti, Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, Barbados, and again, Puerto Rico, and we do know that Puerto Rico is not a country. This is the sampling uh, design, uh, sample areas of the NSAL. Again, this is what you would expect, heavily in the South, heavy in the Northeast because of the Black Caribbean, and again, lighter in the West. Then again, this is what you would absolutely expect from this type of sample. These are some of the areas that are covered. I'm gonna go through this part a little quickly. It's like three or four slides of this. So neighborhood, religion, how do the function, functioning, um, uh, a large mental health section, the use of health resources, again, sort of a mental health section, discrimination, immigration, politics, screening in terms of mental health sections, uh, screening questions, depression, panic disorder. Again, I'm going through this part pretty quickly. Uh, social phobia, generalized anxiety disorder, suicidality, uh, PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. 30-day symptoms, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, a gambling screen, uh, separation anxiety, and of course, uh, uh, service utilization. So I'm gonna take a little step back and do something that's sort of unusual for ICPSR. It's really important to remember that our respondents are people. Really easy to forget this when we're taking uh, st statistics classes, when we're doing data analysis, when we're worried about what's the latest and what's the strongest technique and are we doing our analysis correctly. Um, we get, especially if you're doing secondary data analysis, and you've really never been in the field, it's very easy to get away from the fact that these are real, that respondents are real people um, who have real issues um, and they're not just a number. So I want to give you a little bit of interviewer experience. So I will read these to you. I had to interview one elderly lady. When I asked a question about her teeth and gums, she said, well, my gums are excellent, but I don't have any teeth. We had a great rapport at that time and we both rolled and left. Every time that I go into the field, I learn a little something. The most moving thing is just how many people there are who are very lonely and who really need someone to talk to people for whom my visit makes a world of difference. Here's another one. There was the illiterate woman for whom I had to read the respondent booklet who had a, had, has a public assistant income of $500 per month. Her roommate told me that the respondent had gotten up early to prepare for the interview and spent two hours dressing and cleaning the room we used. There was the man who suffered severe depression after the death of his wife. He rushes out to talk to me and tell me how he's doing every time I am in his neighborhood. There was the man who was waiting with pictures of his cats to show me. The man who told me about the statue in his front yard he put out in memory of his neighbor. And there's the last experience. And let me just mention with all of these experiences that um, 
these are the, some of the ones that stand out. Um, uh, the ones that are, you know, a pretty standard, uh, uh, obviously the interviewer doesn't write up much about those. So here's another. One of the greatest things about the study that respondents have said to me is that the interview is the first time anyone has ever asked them how and what they felt and thought. They said that they appreciated me coming into their home. Several respondents tried to give me their incentives back. And let me mention, this is something you see a lot with the black people, is that in our society that people feel like either uh, feel invisible. And so having somebody come to talk to them and ask them about their experiences uh, means a lot. So moving ahead a little bit, based on data that we collected uh, starting since uh, ending in May 2020, um, we've had 475 journal articles that are based on the NSAL, either solely on the NSAL or in conjunction with another collaborative psychiatric disorder uh, uh, sample. 50 NSAL adolescent articles and 65 dissertations. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the research findings. Again, I'm not gonna spend a, a lot of time on this. And as you can see, I'm gonna go back one slide real quick. There's no way in the world I can cover the, the findings in all these articles. And it's debatable what people would argue are the most important findings in these articles. So I'm gonna talk about some of our, a little bit early work on that sort of came out and again, the purpose of these papers were not on gender differences, just the gender differences were so strong. So Sean Zhou has one of our first major papers. It was published in the Journal of American uh, Medical Association. And he found that 4.1% of African-Americans and Black Caribbeans have attempted suicide in their lifetime. And what we see here is there some really big gender differences, in particular with Black Caribbean men. You see this 7.5% of Black Caribbean men have attempted suicide in their, over their lifetime, compared to only 2.7 Black Caribbean women. The issue is that difference is so big that it's relatively unusual. Here's another study by David Williams in the Archives of General Psychiatry. And it's changed its name, I can't remember. Oh yeah, the name of the journal now is JAMA Psychiatry. And this is looking at, I'm pretty sure it's 12 month major depression. And what you normally find is this, is that women have higher levels of depression than men. You find that among whites, you find it here among African Americans, you see 13% of African-American women have depression, 12-month depression, compared to 7% of African-American men. That is what you would expect. But what you see here with Black Caribbeans is this 12.6% is very high for Black Caribbean men. And here's the last part in terms of gender differences. So, Let me first mention what are negative interactions with family. Negative interaction is an uh, argument, criticism, uh, some type of, of negative affect um, in terms of interaction, in terms of um, uh, communication. And what you expect is that women have more negative interactions with their family than men, mainly because women have a lot more interactions with their family which has the opportunity for a lot more negative interaction. And you see this with African-Americans. African-American women right here have more, significantly more negative interactions with their family than African-American men. You do not see the same gender difference, at least in terms of statistical significance, among Caribbean, Black Caribbeans, and even more, men are just a little bit higher. It's not significantly higher 
But the fact is you would expect a pattern like what you see with African Americans. And you see the same pattern with African Americans, you see the same pattern with whites. So now I'm gonna talk about a little bit about microaggressions and uh, discrimination. So first is going to give you a little history of research on microaggressions. Well, Chester Pierce is a black psychiatrist. He's the first person to come up with the concept of uh, uh, microaggressions. Darrell Wing Su is the person who's most known for this type of research. And because they're psychologists and psychiatrists, a lot of their work is qualitative. A lot of work in this field is qualitative. A lot of it's within the therapeutic environment or with college students. This is one of Darrell Wing Su's major papers, um, which is in the American Psychologist. So what I want to mention now is switch a little bit because everyday discrimination, everyday racism is actually very similar to the construct of microaggression. So, and this is where uh, the Program for Research on Black Americans comes in. So Philomena Essid wrote this book, a great book, on discrimination and racism among black women in the United States. And I believe black women, and I know in Europe, and I believe it's in the Netherlands, but I'm not, I can't, I'm not positive about that. And David Williams took the information from this qualitative study and came up with a scale. That scale was first used in um, one of our 95 studies, a Detroit area study. And this is one of, the, I believe, it's the first publication from that scale. These are the scale items right here. And what you see is that becomes, as you go higher, it becomes a little bit more, um, more serious. So, you know, less courtesy you start off with, and then you get to levels of insulted or threatened or, or, or harassed. And what you notice, if you look at these right here, these map on really consistently with microaggressions. So there are numerous previous studies using the scale so research on African-Americans, on Asians, Latinos, and they, for the most part, find this, that um, discrimination is positive associated with poor physical and mental health. This includes self-reported health, uh, mortality, poor sleep, various biomarkers, such as uh, um, coronary artery, nighttime blood pressure, visceral fat, and inflammation among as I said, there's lots of studies in this area. I have maybe two or three studies, two or three more studies to cover, and then we'll be finished with our presentation tonight. So I want to mention this paper by Verna Keith and uh, her colleagues here. And again, this is a, a discrimination paper. And in this paper, they, uh, I should say, we identified four classes of discrimination. Low levels of discrimination, disrespect and condescension, character-based discrimination, and high levels. So the character base is a more serious, afraid of you, dishonest. The disrespect is less respect. I mean, the, the disrespect is low levels of respect, and that was, again, a, a bit less serious. So, if you can follow me, what you'll see is the low discrimination is this uh, color right here. And at every level, people said they're not getting, feeling much discrimination. The high is here. Again, these individual at every level, they're having high levels of discrimination. And then uh, one, the uh, disrespect and condescension, condescension is high levels of the, of the lower magnitude and lower levels of the more serious. 
And then the other one is high levels of more serious types of discrimination. Here's another paper, uh, again, with uh, close to the same team on discrimination among African-American men. And what we find in this paper is African-American men who spend time in jail or prison experience the most frequent levels of discrimination. Um, younger men experience more discrimination and education is positively related to discrimination. The education finding is pretty consistent, which means that especially as African-Americans, um, the higher your level of education, the more exposure you have to uh, people of the races, and then the, the higher the likelihood of discrimination. This is a, a paper that's in press on um, discrimination, uh, depression, uh, depressive symptoms, and suicidal ideation. And I just want you to pay attention to one or two things. So number one, uh, Every, everyday discrimination that's non-racial based is not linked to suicidal ideation, nor does it have an indirect path. So indirect path would be coming through depressive symptoms and then going here, nor is there indirect path. So there's no relation between uh, non-racial discrimination and suicidal ideation among African-American men. However, racial discrimination there is not only a direct path, which is right here, but also an indirect path that, and again, the indirect path goes through depressive symptoms and suicidal ideation. And this is the last study I'm gonna cover. This is discrimination psychiatric disorders among older African-Americans is looking at both psychiatric disorders as well as, um, as uh, mental health symptoms. And what you see is this. So first, look at the dependent variables, mood disorder, anxiety, any, uh, any anxiety disorder, any disorder period, number of DSM-IV disorders, depressive symptoms, and serious psychological distress. And that's the, using the CAKE-6, which is the Kessler-6. And every model is significant, except for these two. Um, so overall, everyday is, discrimination is significant. Uh, and then these are all separate models. Everyday discrimination is, is significant, except for anxiety disorders where it borders significant, which is right here. And everyday non-racial discrimination is also significant, every model, except this one model with mood disorder. So in conclusion, I have two, con con two concluding points. Number one, there have been the program for research of Amer Black Americans has had numerous graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, and we're still training a nice group of young uh, students and postdocs. Uh, many of our, uh, as we've we shown, many have done really well. Uh, the, our program has done the, conducted two most notable national studies of African Americans is conducted the first and only national study of black ribbons. And outcomes of the NSAL is that it provides important uh, data on African American, black Caribbean, and non Hispanic white population. The data goes well beyond demographic and economic descriptions, large enough sample sizes to investigate within group differences. So you saw some of the papers on older African-Americans on Black Caribbeans, on, on, um, on African-American men as examples. And the NSAL is a larger and more complex follow-up to the 1980 NSBA. Again, thank you for your time this evening. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, David? like to take over? All right, so thank you. Uh, I'm David Thomas, I'm with ICPSR. So I'm gonna provide like the, all right, you heard about all this great data, now how would you get your hands on them? Um, so that's my part of it. 
uh, like the intro, I've been with ICPSR for like, what, 17 years now. Um, and I'm familiar with some of these data, familiar with ICPSR. I'm even familiar with some of the attendees, um, looking at the list and everything like that. Uh, so let's just get dive right into it. All right, so what I'm gonna talk about is what you need to access these data. This is my little contents, right? Like, so then what you need to access these data, that means like what kind of permissions and stuff like that, how you might go about finding these data, uh, important things like reading the documentation, some of your data use options, and then a few studies of interest, um, depending on the amount of time we have, might go out directly to the site. But I always like to provide a little uh, presentation part, just because you can never trust how an internet, live internet demo will go. All right, so accessing the data, first and foremost, like who has access? So uh, the, a lot of the data that were referenced uh, in Dr. Taylor's talk um, are part of our membership archives. In fact, anything at ICPSR is available through the ICPSR site. And as a member, uh, you can access those data. And there are member institutions, over 700 of them, closer to 800 now. And so the high, there's a high likelihood that if you're at the summer program and you're involved in research, then you probably are at one of those institutions. Um, if not, there are ways to figure that out and how you might get access. Um, and maybe we can talk about that later, everything else. Um, one of the best things you need to do when looking for access in the start is to create an ICPSR My Data account. Um, that's just, I mean, we have so many different sites, like as people, right? Citizens of the world, we have so many different logins and stuff like that. So this would just be another one. Um, you can use like, uh, use it through like if a Google linked account, uh, you can use your, um, oh, um, your ORC, I call it ORC ID. Some of those that people log in and manage those things. Um, that's what you would do. We do suggest that you use an, e an institution email address as your email address. That helps us with just uh, verifying uh, that you're at a member institution. Do want to say though that with some of the data we have, they're federally sponsored. So then the data are free as well. But if you want to get access to the full array of ICPSR studies, then it's best uh, to use that and then you get all that by being at a member institution. And then the next step of access, once you've created that My Data account and it's been verified, then you just start using data. Um, you know, searching and using data. And another important thing is that user support is available. So if you run into problems, you can definitely uh, talk to, you can send an email to us, depending on what the issue is. Uh, we have dedicated staff who can answer your problem. A lot of the things that happen are like with access and verification, particularly at this time where people are working remotely during a pandemic, all of that, um, you know, and so, you know, as we learn as an organization, we're able to better answer the questions and deal with that. Um, and now finding the data, you know, so you've gotten your login, you figured it out, now you want to find some data. Um, as I mentioned about the overall ICPSR, all the data can be accessed from that main page. We have other sites, uh, you see a little further down, I talk about specific archive project pages. That was just one example. But you go to the site and you can just start looking for data. There's like a find data thing. You go in there and that's how you do it. You can, you know, find data, search for your terms. You might look for race. We do a lot of subject term stuff. You might look for um, mental health, stress, depression, anxiety, all those things. And what happens is, you know, the it's like, any other search at this point, you know, that's how you're going to find these studies that you want. And you're able to narrow down the studies and figure that out. Like, okay, well, maybe I want this one. Maybe I want that one. Explore some of the data, stuff like that. We have a search box because who doesn't have a search box? Um, and this search box allows people, you can find data, but you can also find documentation and other things on our site. So it's kind of split up that way. Um, also, you know, you can use Google. Google is one of the best ways that people get to our data. 
um, the most common ways that people get to our data. They just type it in Google and because, you know, Google is what it is and, you know, we're pretty, um, we've been around for what, 50 years. Um, and so, you know, we have a strong web presence. We're strong in searching and given um, the reach of our services and everything, what happens is, you know, people use Google to find our stuff. You could also go to specific archive project pages. Um, if you remember during my introduction, we talked about the Resource Center for Minority Data. So it makes sense that I would use that as my example for a specific archive project page. Also given uh, the topic of tonight's discussion, right? Um, and just a little background. This is a project started by ICPSR that is around uh, data on underrepresented populations. So it goes across subject matter, and content and goes to population sample. And this is important uh, to note because it was at the time we started doing it, this was not a way we were thinking. We were mostly organized by like, if you wanted to look at health and medical care, you went to that particular archive. If you wanted to look at aging research, you went to another particular archive. But this is looking at the populations and saying, oh, okay, so based on this population, this is where you could go. Again, all these data, are available at the main ICPSR site. Lots of people don't really care whether it's ICPSR, or RCMD, they just see it as all one ICPSR um, and they wanna get data. Now, an important thing once you get to the data site and you get to the data page and you're reading it is to go and look through the documentation, right? And that's it, read the documentation. Um, we can't stress this enough when we talk about what we're doing and we're talking about, you know, people using data, read the documentation. I said it now three times, right? Like, because questions come up and you need to know things. Uh, was a complex sample design used? Um, do I have to use weights? If I, if I want to do a subpopulation, what should I do? You know, strata, cluster, all these things, these are the things you need to know. And you only know that by reading the documentation. Um, another good part of the documentation is you get to look at the code book and see what happened in the data. Like, you know, we give you a code book and it has like, you know, frequencies and everything like that. Any user guides and the questionnaires I left off, like, you know, the data collection instruments, which can also help you figure out what kind of questions you might want to use in the future uh, for your own primary work but also you can search across and find similar questions and stuff like that. One of the things, if we have time, I'm gonna to go uh, to the, uh, what we call the CPES for short. Um, Dr. Taylor referenced it, and it's uh, the survey, National Survey of American Life is part of that. And you can do some comparisons and see that. And that was one of the first studies that kind of, on our end, allowed you to do that kind of work to see what happened across the different surveys. And so it's really nice. We also have a, a variables page you can look at to look for questions that way. And I'll try to go out to that and show you that as well. Um, now, your data use options. All right. So we have a variety of formats um, over time. Uh, we started with, uh, like initially when I started, there was SAS and SPSS. That's what people could get and ASCII files. And that's like a text file that you might use um, what we call syntax files with. Um, so it's like the code that makes the data files. Uh, a lot of people now, I think are using, you know, more like you get the SAS dot, uh, what? So a SPSS would be a dot SAV file, SAS is, I'm blanking on it, but you know what I'm talking about. Uh, the BDAT file, you know, all those things. Uh, now, now there's data around and there's R and all those other things um, for, for example, for the National Survey of Black Americans, um, because it's um, a little bit older study, what your options are like STATA, I think SAS, SPSS, and some of those studies of that time period will have online analysis capabilities. So even if you don't have a statistical package on your machine, you can still use, you can still do some analysis and stuff like that. Um, more recent data have R files um, and, you know, R being open source free, you know, that's a big draw. Um, and also tab delimited files for use with pretty much anything. We would say Excel or Google Sheets, but however you want to go about it. Um, so those are other options that you have to do that. Now, um, 
I want to show you and get into uh, some of the studies that were talked about. Um, we're looking at uh, the study page for the National Survey of Black Americans. So if you bear with me, I'm going to click on this link and we're going to go out to that particular study. Can I verify with Scott that you're seeing the study page? Yes, wonderful. All right, so what you see right here is the National Survey of Black Americans. And I just wanna uh, kind of show you a few things. So this is what you would get if you go to like an ICPSR study page and you see some initial things. The project description's right here. Um, so that tells you, um, you know, what's going on in any study. And you can see the citation. And this is really important to us, something really dear to our hearts, that people cite data. Um, we give it to you right here. All you have to do is copy it and stick it into any publication. This is really important for one, there's one particular reason is that that way people know what data you used. Um, another thing is that one of the val, in a broader sense, you know, in our mission, particularly at RCMD, a lot of these data are held and known by word of mouth um, in a lot of ways when we started. But by having these data citations, you know, people can have access to these data and know where to get these data. And they can know that, you know, if this person got it from ICPSR and this person got it from ICPSR, that, you know, they're going to have roughly the same data. They should, um, you know, now whatever changes they might have made on their own, that's a different thing, but they, they're starting from the same point. And so for replication and for continuation, and for all those things, this is a good way to go about that and to know that. Um, I mentioned like the subject terms and the keywords and here you have it right here, um, the different subject terms so that you can know and you can, if you click on one of them, you know, that's gonna give you other studies and how that might work and ways to just kind of, you know, figure out where you might want to go next. I mean, just clicking on racial discrimination, what you're seeing is you're seeing again National Survey of Black Americans and then the another one with different waves like that. So, you know, that's just a good way to kind of go about that. Um, and then there are some things that I just want to highlight that come up. If you click on these, you'll see the scope of the project and that's useful and you have data collection notes that you know, might answer questions or let you know what's going on as well as methodology so you know what you need to do, um, what your universe is, what your sample was, what kind of data, what was going on. And if you cared, you know, you could also see the version history to see what changes were made um, when updates happened and stuff like that. So these are all good and important things to know. Oh, someone's. David. Mm -hmm. I was mistaken. I see the image of the uh, of the survey site on the slide, but I don't see the actual web browser version of it. Oh, all right. Well, let me make sure that, that happens. All righty. That's fine. And so now people should see the subject terms that I was just talking about. Um, I like that you just that people believe me, hopefully, that there were subject terms. Um, and this is what I was talking about as far as scope of the project um, right here. I'll slow down a little bit because I know that things take a little bit of time um, to refresh. And as I was saying, you also see the methodology right here. So you can see that as well um, to see what was going on. Another thing I want to highlight is then you have your data and documentation. And it shows you the main file. And then this button here will show you what kind of options you have for download. Um, in this particular case, there's no online analysis available. That's OK. Um, Another piece is this variable search tool. Uh, many people find this one useful um, because you can uh, narrow down what you're looking for. So 
I might type in discrimination and then see what variables pop up. And then I can see if I click on any particular variable, I can see the question up here and I can see uh, the, the value labels and the answers, the responses. And then I can also see on the side here, different types of questions. Um, so that's really useful for figuring out many things like a lot of people cluster questions together, um, you know, in a particular study. And so all those things, you can figure those out, look at those um, and then go from there. So you can figure out also like whether or not a particular study in, in a broader sense is what you want before you go through the, it's not really that much trouble anymore, but before you download data and start reading further. Um, and then Dr. Taylor talked about some of the publications that came out of these data. Um, and so we're not gonna have all of those. However, what we do have are a lot of publications. Um, and you can see just up top here, I use my hands a lot, but you can't see that. Um, so I have to use the mouse. Um, you know, like the first citation, you'll see that, you know, this one citation used, what was that, five different uh, studies from ICPSR. Um, you know, and then so you can, figure those things out and kind of see what's going on and, you know, stuff like that. And we see a lot of the same names as Dr. Taylor mentioned, um, including his own. Uh, so, and so uh, this was, I went in and I identified some of the different studies we have associated with the National Survey of American Life. And what you'll see um, you'll see three studies here. You'll see the adolescent supplement, the self-administered questionnaire, and then you'll see this broader study here. Um, and within this broader study, you have uh, the National Survey of American Life, the National Latino and Asian American Survey, the National Comorbidity Survey. Um, so it's a grouping of studies. Um, and so, and that's why we call them the CPES, Actually, that's not why we call them the CPES, but they're called the CPES. Um, and they joined together these three studies. And then you see that there were other studies around that. Um, because of the whole, you know, going back and forth, I'm not going to do that. So I have a screenshot of the page to show you some of what that's like. Um, you know, and we're seeing again those same names uh, that were mentioned before, that were mentioned in Dr. Taylor's. Uh, lecture and talk. Um, and we see online analysis capabilities and we see all the at a glance and all of that. Um, a really important piece though is what we see here is that you have these four different studies and they are available through online analysis. Um, so if you just wanted to look at the National Survey of American Life, you could do that. If you just wanted to look at the comorbidity survey, you could do that. If you just wanted to look at Latino and Asian American survey, you could do that. But if you wanted to look at the whole thing, you could do that as well and make comparisons. And like I said, see you know, what questions were asked and how they might have been asked across the different studies and surveys in this, in this one uh, study. So you can get this one study and get all of this data. Um, and so that makes it super useful. Um, there's also a crosswalk that you can access there um, to see, you know, like how things might change and what, like I said, what questions and how they were asked across them and make comparisons of the answers as well. Um, and in this, I included like a live out link. I didn't do it because we're not doing that again. Um, I talked kind of fast and I was supposed to go over the data side of it. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing so people have time to like, you know, ask questions. Thanks, David. Um, before we get into the questions, I'll just mention really quickly, if you joined us late, um, this 
lecture, like all of our other lectures, will be up on YouTube. And if you're on YouTube right now, maybe give us a subscribe and a like while you're there. Uh, so first we have um, more of a comment here, someone who says they personally have not published with the data, but they have friends who have, and they have not had issues with the age of the data. Um, I don't know if Robert, you wanted to comment on publishing with older data. Uh, for the most part, we don't have um, any problems. We clearly have to note it as a limitation. Uh, there are a few instances here and there that a paper has been rejected solely on that basis. Um, and a lot of it depends on the reviewers. The viewers who understand African American survey research understand that this is still the, the best game in town. The viewers who are unfamiliar with research on African Americans um, are unf unfamiliar with the um, large scale survey data. Um, they're more likely to really push the age of the data set. Okay, thank you. Uh, this next question is for David. Does ICPSR have any qualitative data? Yes, um, we do have some. We are primarily a quantitative data shop. Um, we're getting more and more, more and more into qualitative qualitative data, and a lot of data now have pieces to them that say, like you know, open-ended questions and stuff like that that we try to present that way. Um, a lot of in those instances, what will happen will be that those parts of the data uh, will be restricted access. And there's a whole protocol that people go through to get access to those data. Um, so I would say, yes, we have some qualitative data. We're always looking for more. So if that's something you know you have, we're happy to take it. Um, but yes, but again, we are primarily a quantitative data shop, but we do have qualitative data and we're trying to get more. Um, one of the, one of the, things about, at least in my experiences, uh, you know, these types of data is that a lot of things are done, like, you know, there is a lot of qualitative, rich qualitative data out there. Um, so, yeah. Uh, we have a question now for Dr. Taylor. I noticed when you were presenting the results of the study on suicide, that larger numbers of Caribbean men commit suicide and smaller numbers of American women do. But when you presented the slide on depressive symptoms, there was a higher number of black women who had depressive symptoms. Has anyone found out why? Yeah, let me, uh, let me indicate, and that's our, first of all, I have done research in those areas, but I don't consider myself uh, the expert in those areas. Um, but what you see, and this is pretty standard, is that women tend to have higher levels of depressive symptoms and higher levels of depression than men. Again, for African Americans and whites in our society. Uh, however, when it comes to suicide, um, suicide is a little unusual. Sometimes you get a little higher rates from men uh, but we definitely know is um, in terms of completed suicides, you definitely have higher rates from men. In terms of attempts, it's a little different. And I, again, some of the information I have is a little dated, so I want to be careful about this response. Um, so I should say I don't know as much about attempts what I can definitely say in terms of completed suicides, and to some degree attempted suicides, is that men use more, in our society, use more lethal means, much more likely to use guns. Uh, women are much more likely to use, um, to, to, to not use, I should say to not use guns, to, um, to attempt in other ways. Thank you. Um, we have another one, I think, for Dr. Taylor. What's the best way 
for graduate students to stay updated on PRBA opportunities and workshops? Um, just email me and I'll put you on one of our um, email lists that we send out. Uh, the other thing is to, if you're on Twitter to follow us on Twitter. Uh, we announce a lot of stuff there, but we do our most of our announcements through uh, email. And anybody gets to add their name to our email list and uh, or just email me and I'll and I will add the name either personally or an assistant. This one, I think both of you might be able to weigh in. Um, any advice on explaining the importance of using African American specific data or studies to reviewers and PIs who are not familiar with this information? I, I would love to say that's easy. Uh, um, it's, it's harder, it's much harder than it should be because there are times you get sort of caught in this, in a bind which is you have a great paper, you have interesting findings, and, um, and, the, and uh, a reviewer may say, well, yeah, that's not important because the findings on whites are the same, so it's nothing new. And then 15 years later, uh, somebody says, yeah, there's never been any research on this. And, and of course they haven't been because people have rejected the earlier papers. So, what you really have to do is sort of is sort of make the case, uh, go through previous literature, uh, you know, work is there's still a somewhat hostile environment. However, it's not as hostile as it used to be. For what for what it's worth, um, we still on you know, we still get rejected. I still get rejected. Uh, I had a review today that asked the same thing, which is we had a paper. Slow, solely on Black Caribbeans. And the reviewers both said, two reviewers both said, oh, isn't it a shame that we did not take the, uh, the great opportunity to compare them with whites? So better than it was, because you know, 40 years ago when we were doing our first papers, uh, we would have got a rejection. Okay, so instead of a, it's a shame. Uh, that being said, uh, we shouldn't have to, nobody should have to, the, to justify why you're doing work on African Americans or Caribbeans or other groups. Uh, David? Now I feel that's kind of like a drop the mic kind of moment. So, you know, like I'm good. Okay. <laughs> um, so we are. Oh, wait, one just came in here. Uh, can Dr. Taylor elaborate briefly on how revolutionary it was to conduct a national survey of Black Americans with no white comparison group? So, again, I was a student then, but I talked to James Jackson a lot about this, and he's presented a lot about like this, and he said he had lots of, of contentious battles um, to do a study that's only on African Americans. Uh, even when we did NSAL, the only reason that we, we our, our goal was really not to include whites when we started, but because the way all the issues in the research were framed, everything was framed as a racial comparison. But to go back to the first survey, uh, James Jackson will tell you that he had lots of, of uh, battles, um, both around the country and internally at ISR of why would you do this study? Why is it important? Why only African Americans, you know, or at that time, why only black people? So it was revolutionary. One of our first papers uh, was rejected in a, you know, like one or two lines, which is no white comparison group uh, very early on. So we definitely had those battles. Um, and then sort of going back to early question, what we had to put in, start putting in our papers was the sort of what I said earlier is that uh, it's important to do within group analysis because within group analysis, you can look at age differences and gender differences and whatever it is among blacks. But a racial comparison only gives you that blacks and whites are either the same or they're different. 
you really learn nothing about black people within, or you, I shouldn't say nothing, I should say it's very limited. Now there is a role for racial comparison work. I'm not saying there isn't a role, but I'm saying it shouldn't be exclusive. So we are out of questions. We'll give it another 30 seconds or so to see if any more trickle in. Well, I want to thank everybody for, for tuning in on this Wednesday evening. I really appreciate it myself. All right, um, this is Stephanie uh, Carpenter, the program manager for the ICPSR summer program. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Thank you, David, for your presentation tonight. We're deeply honored to have you both present on this. Um, and uh, the audience is also um, expressing their gratitude. Um, the uh, Blaylock Lecture Series is going to continue for the next four weeks. Uh, I'd like to um, alert everyone to our talk for tomorrow night. Um, it's going to be presented by uh, Dan Merkel of ABC News. Um, he's going to be presenting on um, methodological issues in exit polling. He's gonna discuss um, sampling, questionnaire design, non-coverage, uh, weighting, and he's also going to have um, a bit of a discussion on COVID-19 and the implications for exit polling uh, this year. So we do hope that you will be able to join us for that presentation at 7.30 p.m. Eastern time using the same Zoom link. Uh, and if you have more interest in the Wayog Lectures, our schedule is on our website. Um, thank you again, Dr. Taylor. Thank you, David. And um, thank you all for joining us. We hope you have a lovely and safe evening. Take care. Okay, thank you, everybody.